Um, so then I, and just coincidentally, um, as a result of that, I thought, well, conditioning would be a, a quite an interesting topic to um, discuss because, in my opinion, um, I feel it's a, a topic that's um, even at the very elite level um, misunderstood and misapplied quite a lot. Um, and it just happens to be an area I did an honours project in as well. Um, also, I should preface the presentation by saying I don't have any inbuilt interactive sections like Johnny, so don't hesitate to ask questions throughout because I, um, whilst I might not be able to explain a concept to you guys, I've, I'm sure I've got some um, practical um, evidence on my USB that I've used with triathlon, um, hockey, netball, etc. Um, background about myself, I currently work with uh, triathlon, which is a dual role, so sports science, SNC role, um, hockey, and also um, uh, track and field. Uh, I have worked with diving, golf, and also netball. Um, I'll get into this. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with these uh, energy systems. So basically, the, you've got the anaerobic, alactic, or the ATP, PC energy system. Um, you've got the lactic or the anaerobic glycolysis energy system. And also you've got the, probably what's most commonly uh, known is the, just the aerobic energy system. Can anyone think of a particular event or activity that um, is predominantly fueled by one of those energy systems? Yep. Marathon running. Yep, perfect. Any others? Sorry? Yeah, yep, yeah, correct. Uh, anaerobic glycolysis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, I guess the field sports is a combination of all three at different points in time. Uh, probably an obvious one for that is 400 meter running um, in track and also probably uh, 100 meter swimming as well. Um, you can flick on. Thanks, man. Um, the important thing to consider here is that the energy systems don't work independently. Um, they work together. Um, it is the proportion of the contribution that changes and that's governed by the intensity of the exercise. So basically what I want to convey today is the benefits of using objective training over subjective training. So an example is um, if you work with a bunch of netballers and you say to them, I want you to run, do 10 100 meter sprints at 85%. 85% for athlete A is going to be entirely different for um, athlete B. So I guess the basis of my project and also the, my philosophy for conditioning is trying to use um, either a test or, or it could be a time trial or, or an event to um, basically use as your main intensity measure to base all your prescription off. So then the, se the sessions are actually objective and quantifiable. Um, we'll, we'll get into more detail on that later, but that's basically the, the premise behind this presentation. Um, so if you look at the training methods, the, the most important one would be mode of exercise. So if you think about that logically, um, if you're working with a running based athlete, uh, it makes sense to train them specific to the task. So the conditioning you would prescribe is running. Um, can anyone think of a particular scenario where that might not be possible? Yeah, injury? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in that case, I think the, the, the best, I, mean, I think you, your best approach is to try and at least maintain the quality through other modalities, whether it be water running, bike, elliptical, whatever the, the ailment is. Um, also, uh, I guess one thing that's, or one sport or one example that's particular, particularly contradictory to what I just said is, um, I guess like, and it falls back with, with Simon's role in talent transfer. Can anyone think of a sport um, that fosters uh, good talent for another sport? And I'm thinking of a particular athlete um, who just competed in rowing at the most recent Olympics. Um, so, yes, yeah, exactly. So Drew Ginn is the example I'm thinking of, and basically, um, as part of rowing, they, especially in Australia, do heaps of um, ergo or bike work. Um, so, typically, uh, that the, it's 
rowing has become a bit of a feeder for producing quite uh, proficient um, time trialists and Drew is an example of that. Um, so I guess the main reasons being is that it's the actual energy system contribution is very similar. So they're both predominantly aerobic sports um, and also the, the movements in terms of like the kinematics are similar, both lower body dominant, whilst there is an upper body contribution in rowing, but it's min minimal um, or should be kept minimal anyway. Um, and also the, the actual speed of movement is quite similar, i.e. The, the actual, if you look at the stroke rate and compare that to a cadence used in cycling, they're fairly similar. And skip that. Um, so this specific slide relates back to what I said before about trying to establish something that is objective. So basically what you're trying to do there is express the intensity or difficulty of the effort. Um, and ways in which you can do that um, include speed, obviously, running, cycling, rowing. You can use um, a percentage of max speed or a certain meters per second. You can use heart rate, and I know that's very popular. Um, you can use percentage of max or a specific zone. Um, you can use oxygen uptake and to prescribe uh, as a percentage of VO2 max. Or you can use, um, as in some sports, like rowing and cycling, um, power output. Um, can anyone identify or highlight any particular issues with any of those? <laughs> yep, so heart rate being variable, yep. So it, it is not the most stable measure um, and it's influenced by uh, environmental conditions, stress, sleep, general health and well-being. Um, can anyone else think, pertaining to heart rate, can anyone else think of a, another reason why, if you're actually administering a session, why it would be really hard to do so using heart rate, if you, if you had a squad of athletes? Yeah, yep, yep. It's a disparity in fitness. Monitoring? Yeah, exactly, it's impossible. So you, you might have five athletes and as they're running past you, you're asking all five of them simultaneously what their heart rate is. So typically heart rate analysis is done retrospectively, which is fine when you finish, so you can work out how effective the session was, but it makes it really hard to actually administer the session effectively. Um, any other ones on there that uh, would be difficult to implement? Some would be difficult to test. Some would be difficult to test. Yeah, yep. To actually get their maximum rates or outputs uh, compared to others anyway, so depending how much time you Resources. Yep, absolutely. And I guess a glaring example of that is um, prescribing based off as a percentage of VO2 max. To really accurately do that, you'd need a portable, um, portable MECART, um, which not uh, most organizations, organizations don't have. Um, I'll throw this out to the group. Um, do any of you prescribe according to any of those that are listed? Yeah? Feel free to share. Uh, heart rate. Heart rate, yep. yep. Right. What sport, sorry? sorry. What sport? Uh, triathlon. triathlon, yep. Um, but I actually get each individual athlete to do a VO2 max test yep. on actually the lab. So. Okay. And then, and then so is your, so with your use of heart rate, is that done to, is that done in a prescriptive purpose? So you say, I want you to do this session in zone four and then you just trust the athlete to do that, or do you, yeah, okay. Similar? Yeah. 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 Any others? Yep. Yeah. Use speed um, for the people who are doing it then for uh, cross-training use. They're able to make a bike or something like that, like power bands, but um, yep. yeah, speed, for, like a max aerobic speed, and they work from there. Okay. Um, yep. So you use a, uh, Matt, like, what's, what do you use as your, so you use mass as your intensity measure. What do you use to um, establish or determine that maximal aerobic speed? Well, we test for that. What test do you use? Uh, we use a 2K time trial. Okay. Yep. yep. Any others? Glenn? Uh, we use lactic acid for heart rate. And we also use minutes per second. Yep. Okay. For what sport? 
canoeing. Yeah. And I guess um, so. What uh, Glenn just said there is probably common in sports such as so using like a I guess a multifaceted approach is really common with sports like cycling, canoeing, and rowing, where they use you know lactate, heart rate, um, and wattage, and, and another prescriptive measure all concurrently. Um, now. I'll, I don't mean to harp on about this, but the issue here, and some of these lend themselves to it more than others, but basically the subjective prescription, um, in my opinion, is uh, suboptimal. And an ex uh, I've got a, an example for you is I had three athletes um, complete a yo-yo intermittent recovery test, level one, which, which is what I use to establish your maximal aerobic speed. Um, I had the results, I calculated their, velo their individual velocities for, that were going to be used for training. I then, before I did that though, I got them to do the equivalent session um, and I basically I said they were, they were going to do four sets of four minutes at 90% of mass and I gave them the same, same instructions except didn't give them any guidance as to the speed. And the, can anyone guess the difference in um, actual speed in kilometres per hour between, um, between two girls? as they uh, subjectively rated 90%. Are they, are they doing riding? So, uh, running on a treadmill. So they're doing four sets of four minutes, 90%, and that's all I got told. And then I, I had my, their um, actual speeds that I was supposed to run at. And the difference was, uh, I think for between two of them, it was six Ks an hour. So it just, again, it just highlights the need to, especially when you're being precise with everything else in your program, I think this is often an area that's paid scant attention to, so I th and I think it's one that's really important. Um, next slide, Simon. Oh well, no, absolutely not, because the those two girls, their actual difference in prescription based off the test was uh, 0.7 k's of an hour, so less than a k an hour difference. Yet when they were subjectively assessing the session. It was six k's an hour. That's what I'm saying. That being more efficiency. Oh, I don't think so. I think if you, it's like if you got them to run around an athletics track uh, as hard as they can for um, ninety percent, I would say the actual intensity they ran in those treadmill sessions that would be the same. It's just their perceived um, exertion, I guess. Yep. Are they running next to each other? Yeah, next to each other. And the well, I mean, as much as I could, the speed was blocked but it's not hard to work out that someone's running 6Ks an hour faster than you. <laughs> um, so, and running, uh, a running example here, so the, basically this is the, like the, most, the, the easiest way to, dis to um, uh, discuss the concept, and someone's already touched on it there with, I don't know, I think it's from Geelong Footy Club. So basically you do a time trial or a beep test or a yo-yo test, and that becomes the test you use to establish your maximal aerobic speed which you then subsequently use for prescription. So obviously the, the, far, the whoever, if you run a quicker time trial or run further in a beep test, that equates, to, um, that equates to a higher average velocity, which in turn you then use for prescription. So fitter athletes work harder. Um, and I guess one of the major benefits of taking this approach, uh, in my opinion, is that um, the, the session um, regardless of the you know, athlete buying is stable and consistent. So um, you might have athletes that don't buy in and are lazy, etc. And when you give them subjective sessions, they slack off and run six Ks an hour slower than someone else. With this session, with, with this type of approach, there's no way for them to do that. You, basically the distance or time or the speed is set for them. Um, and also that makes, um, that makes administering the sessions really simple as well. So basically for a, you know, a treadmill session you might have the speeds listed on, printed on a sheet or written on a whiteboard and everyone knows their, what speed they've got to be working at. You might have lanes set up on a field. So yeah, and I've got some specific examples if you want to go into that later on. Um, I know uh, the... Um, I I spoke to someone before and they mentioned that it would be good to find out um, where these concepts originated from. So basically, if you're, actually, if you're interested in these and you wanted to investigate it further, um, this concept has been around since about 1990 um, and it's originated from Veronique Billet, who's a prolific French researcher 
in the area and she looked at aerobic conditioning prescription um, in middle distance runners and uh, so basically this concept that I'm using for, that I've adapted for field sports actually originated from um, uh, research done in track and field basically um, sorry just take a back step the, also the her, her research was using VO2 max testing so as such the concept then so when you establish a, a velocity on the treadmill is, is referred to as velocity at VO2 max maximal aerobic speed is um, a speed established from a field test not on a treadmill so big test yo-yo time trial uh, UMTT whatever test you use some are actually more accurate than others but we won't go into that Well, it's um, specific to the sport. So um, I think initially as part of your needs analysis, you need to establish whether the, this energy system is actually integral for the sport. So if it's a 400 meter runner, uh, I would say you're wasting your time assessing this quality. Like it's, it, it's, it's important, but it's not the most important quality. So speed is a much more important quality for a 400 meter runner. So I think it all relates back to a needs analysis, work out what, uh, what, what requirements um, make up the sport, and then from that establish like a testing battery. And I guess importantly, once you do test, use the testing for, for something. Don't just collect data for the sake of it. Does that answer the question? Um, but in saying that, it, I, I think you said that um, it, it's, it's also an assessment of someone's lactic energy system. That's true, but provided you use the right test, the, um, so if you use a beep, yo-yo time trial, and it's, the duration's long enough, it will always be, a, 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 its primary objective or primary outcome will be an assessment of aerobic fitness. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, put it this way, the fitter you are typically, so just speaking very generally here, the fitter you are, um, generally the higher your lactate threshold. So in essence, if you can clear six litres per minute versus someone's five litres per minute, uh, the person who clears six litres per minute is going to have a higher lactate threshold, is going to be able to run faster, cycle faster or row faster. So in essence, like aerobic, the aerobic energy system underpins the anaerobic glycolysis energy system. So, yeah. And I guess a lot of the training you do, whether, like, and we'll get into this later, with interval training, trains the quality concurrently. Like, it's very hard, as I said before, they contribute together. It's hard to just train the aerobic energy system with no contribution from the anaerobic glycolysis. Yeah. Uh, skip that one. Skip that. Oh, actually, no, keep that. Sorry. So the important thing here um, is the last point. Forget about the first two. Um, there are differences between energy system contributions for steady state sports, such as swimming, running, cycling, as, in com as compared to a cyclical sports like field sports. Can anyone highlight to me the major differences? more intermittent in, in, in its nature yeah absolutely and I think as I, I kind of touched on it before I think that's why as part of depending on what sport you work with you need to establish what test is appropriate um, for, for your assessment of the quality so hence why the beep test was developed you know that's a sport that's a test specific to field sports it's not you wouldn't you wouldn't run a 800 meter runner uh, sorry with an 800 meter runner you would not use uh, a beep test it makes no sense because they don't change direction ever. So 
yeah, the, I guess the point is you make the test specific to the sport as much as you can without losing sight of the main, object, the main objective. Um, and also it's, I guess another point I wanted to harp on with this um, pertaining to this is the fact that um, even at the very elite level, team like team sports or in, intermittent sports are still using uh, training strategies or training methods that um, would be more appropriate for steady state sports. Um, which I think there's, I, I definitely think there's a, a more efficient and time effective way of, of prescribing. Um, so these are the different types of aerobic training. Um, is everyone familiar with these concepts? So you've got continuous, um, so that's typically, oh, it's otherwise known as um, long slow distance or low intensity steady state. The fat burning zone falls into this category. Um, you've got fartlek, which is which was a, a concept popularised by Emil Zatopek, who was a um, really uh, a, a great distance runner in the 1950s, which is um, basically subjective interval training. So you run at 85%, um, and then you've got interval training, so which is more prescriptive than fartlek, um, and it's based on research by Billet, Dupont, um, Bethoin, like heaps of French researchers have, have looked at this extensively. Um, so continuous aerobic training, so steady state training. Um, typically you've got here, it's often done two to three times a week. It can be used as cross training. Um, the duration is greater than 15, 20 minutes, but depending on the sport, I know rowing use bike sessions that go in excess of two hours. Um, and I know I, I think so like cycling, for example, would go, f it's not uncommon for cyclists to go for rides that um, last six hours. So the depending on, again, this is, the actual prescription is highly dependent on the sport. Um, we'll just briefly touch on fartlek. Um, so it means speed play. Um, it's, is everyone familiar with fartlek? Have you used it on yourself or prescribed it for, for others? Yeah, yeah. Do you like that method? Yep. Um, have you used the, uh, like, so I guess that's your, I guess an, an adjunct to um, interval training. Have you used another method of, of interval training as well on top of fartlek? Do you use like more uh, prescriptive, um, a more prescriptive type of interval training as well on top of that? What, 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 what I do is low pace sessions on the velodrome and so we have a steady state of speed yep. and interspersed with um, sprint efforts yep. and some longer efforts for, 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 for the lactic but we don't tell them when it's going to happen. Yep, okay. So it keeps them alert yeah, yep. and, we, and we go by um, safety exertion so when they say they're comfortable. Yep. And is that for track cycling? Yeah. yeah. So then we just gauge, we might give them one or two laps and yeah. then we'll accelerate them. So yeah. they have to learn to anticipate the jump. Yeah, and I guess that's very specific to the sport. So when you're in a sprint or a cure and you're often either dictating or reacting to um, a stimulus or stimuli from your opponent. So um, that's a, an example, a good example of where the, the actual method or task is very specific to, to, the, um, to, the, to the sport. And I guess Track cycling is probably um, one glaring example example of where intensity is max, not prescribed. So the data is analysed retrospectively, i.e. someone performs a max sprint or max six second sprint. You don't tell them to hit 1800 watts. You look back, upload the power data and go, you hit 1800 watts. That's your new PB. So that's probably one example where this, and again, this is, and the reason being that's, a, that, that's an, a, an activity um, fueled by the ATP, PC and anaerobic glycolysis energy system, not the aerobic. Um, so on to aerobic interval training. Um, so this is basically where we're going to sort of discuss in detail um, some of the methods um, that are available to you and how you can make them subjective. Does anyone have any questions before I go on? No? Okay. Um, but basically, uh, it entails short intervals of higher intensity interspersed with either active or passive recovery. 
Um, if you're using mass as your ref your intensity measure, it can be um, you can be you can start down at sort of in your intensity ranges um, from 60% all the way up to about 130%. Um, and also the the actual um, sessions can be designed to replicate the demands of the sport. Um, I've got a question for the group. Now, if you've got um, your, you've obviously established that you want to improve aerobic fitness um, and you're going to use interval training, do you replicate, so with your interval training prescription, do you replicate the demands of the sport or do you identify an energy system that you need to train, so obviously the aerobic energy system, and come up with the most, speci most time-effective and, uh, and specific way to achieve that. So do you just focus on the, intense, the actual interval training drill, or do you try and replicate the sport as closely as you can whilst addressing the same quality? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, I, I, and the reason I say there's no clear answer, but I think some people get caught, um, caught up trying to make sessions or drills too specific to the task. And my, my, what I would say there is why not just play the sport if you're trying to do that? And I, and I, and I know that it happens with interval training prescription. It definitely happens with agility training. So you've got um, people setting up you know, all kinds of neat and uh, very confusing agility, agility ladder drills. But the, the actual stimulus you're imposing on the, on the, on the athlete is completely non-specific to the task. For agility, my argument be, would be to make them play, that's agility. Anyway, that's a different topic. So, next slide. So, it can be done one to three times a week. Um, can anyone think why you couldn't complete it five or six times a week? Yeah, just the, in essence, the, the intensity should be so high that you require either a day or a number of days to recover. Um, there's different types. You can do intervals that are classified as short, medium and long, and they might range from five seconds through to 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and I guess the, and that depend, the duration and volume depends on all the factors above, frequency, type and volume. Um, does anyone use uh, interval prescription with either passive or active recovery? Yep. Do you have a preference for either? Active? Yeah. Why is that? Helps them recover. Yep. Anyone else? More for the mental aspect of. Active. Sorry, you said. Yeah. Yeah. How do, how do you ensure that the active recovery is run at an intensity that doesn't compromise the subsequent work sets? Yeah. Speed and heart rate. Yep. What sport? Sorry. Swimming. Yep. How do you um? Assess heart rate in the pool. Golf feel. Yep. Yep. And I know I I know the VIS currently use that model of as you know using predicted heart rate. Um, but they're looking at moving down, or moving into, uh, I guess, a more pace orientated approach to, so something very similar to this. Um, so, anyone else? Active, passive? Yep. It depends on the point, get out of it again, but um, <coughs> more active, I guess. <coughs> something I've read recently that um, you're trying to keep your heart rate up. Yep. And actually see some improvement. So I mean at times you wouldn't teach with a little bit 
but um, generally if that's what you're okay with to improve your max focus speed or your anaerobic threshold, then you can try to keep it heart rate up a little higher so you get a bit shorter dose. Yep, but, uh, absolutely, and that's um, and that's spot on. I mean, the basically the the whole premise behind interval training is to maximise the time spent or at or near VO2 max. So, in essence, that's the most the more time you can spend there per session, the the fit the, the the more effective the session is. And there is research to show that um, using active recovery uh, results in a more stable heart rate and VO2 response. Um, so, if you think of you know like two sets of ten minutes. Um, versus five sets of two minutes with um, so obviously you've got five intervals of recovery in the in the latter option obviously each time you recover there's going to be a dip in vo2 and heart rate which then takes time to get back up so um, yeah that's exactly I mean that's my philosophy as well on, on that um, but I'm not there there are t there's a time and a place to use both um, I think typically it's governed by a what you're trying to get out of it and um, also b what velocity um, you're, you're hoping to um, you're hoping to get the athletes to run at. So there's very good research to show that um, anything supermax. So when you go, as you can see, with intensity, anytime you go above 100%, um, you recruit more type 2 fibers, and as a result of that, you do start producing significantly more lactate. So if you, again, as Glenn touched on before, if you had a specific session that you wanted to be aerobic but have a really heavy anaerobic glycolysis contribution you would run at supermax intensity and as a result of that because the intensity is so high it just wouldn't be possible to use active recovery you'd use passive using both can also help educate the athlete yeah yeah to understand how to gauge where yeah. they are absolutely yeah I, and i agree with that as well um does that make sense so i mean it's i know it's without if you haven't had any um previous exposure to, to this concept that you can see lots of numbers and intensities and it can seem a little bit confusing. Um, would anyone like to see uh, like a specific practical example of this? Yeah? So um, field sport or steady state sport? Field? Yep. So basically, I, is everyone familiar with the yo-yo intermittent recovery test? No. Um, basically, it is uh, it's an intermittent test, obviously, and it's specifically for field sports. Um, it's argued to be more specific to team sports because of the velocities it's run at, um, and unlike the beep test, it encompasses uh, a 10 second active recovery period between each effort um, and also typically athletes that are proficient at acceleration have pretty good max velocity and also are competent at changing direction typically do really well in the yo-yo test um, more so than they would if you had you know two athletes both of similar fitness one had better speed and acceleration they would typically do better in the yo-yo so the reason I said that is because basically uh, this this is basically uh, a yo-yo. So this is so um, so. Just imagine a beep test. Everyone's more familiar with that. This is level ten in the yo-yo. It's level seventeen, and basically that is the velocity associated with each level. So you've got uh, for level seventeen. The velocity is 16 k's an hour or 4.4 meters per second. So if Simon was to run a 17 1, uh, he would be assigned a maximal aerobic speed of 16 k's an hour. And then that figure becomes his 100% value. And all your prescription is done based off that. Does that make sense? Yep. Can anyone see any potential issues with this? Absolutely. So that is absolutely an issue. So if I get 17.8 and Simon gets 17.1, I've run seven extra shuttles, but haven't been rewarded um, with 4.58 meters per second, despite the fact that I've missed it by 
one shuttle. What you then do is use an equation, um, which I can show here. So basically this Excel sheet is something that's evolved over about three years. Um, it has started with my honours project and then, yeah, just grew from there. So there we go, we've got athletes A, 15-1, athlete B, 15-8. They actually, if you look at the, the sheet, it's both 4.17 metres per second or 15 k's an hour. However, when you enter the equation, one gets 4.19 metres per second or 15 k's an hour and the other gets 15 and a half. So that's one way of increasing the test sensitivity. Um, does that make sense as well? So that's another option. Um, I often use that, well, basically if there's, I just establish, once I've done the testing, I establish like a, basically groups, um, which the girls are familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like this. So that's basically Group one is the fittest, group two is the second fit, and group four is the least fit. And basically, that's how they run. They run all the interval sessions in those groups. So basically, as you can see, the, the mass values are, are there in both meters per second and kilometers per hour. Um, and that forms the basis. So basically, that's their intensity measure, or the intensity measure that I use for all their prescription. Um, yep. Good question. Um, well, ideally, um, because again, for testing purposes, it's, I think it's important to consider um, rate of adaptation. Four minutes. Um, so, knowing that aerobic fitness is probably the f of, of all the fitness qualities you could possibly train, responds the quickest, but also detrains the fastest. Um, ideally, I reckon four weeks, but knowing, as you guys can probably attest to, um, sometimes that's just not possible. So um, often I have to test every eight weeks just to fit in with the coach's schedule. And what I do though is at four weeks just adjust the intensities by, you know, depending how fast they've adapted, maybe two and a half percent or five percent. So again, that's the beauty of this approach. Like you could basically with that group in four weeks' time add five percent or two and a half percent to that value and you've accounted for that improvement in fitness. Um, just lastly, I know we've only got four minutes left. Um, I just thought I would show you an actual conditioning plan. In so this is basically how I prescribe. So that's over here is the session one, session two, session type, which probably makes no sense to you, but makes sense to me. So that's just what I call the session. Um, that's the, again, important, be specific with your objective. So increase VO2 max. So how do we do that? Increase time spent at VO2. I want them, because it was early in the preparation, I wanted them, I didn't want them to go into much lactate. So they were running below mass. Um, but I also, because they're field sport players, they need to be able to change direction. And also because we had to, we were forced to, because the, again, another limitation, um, because the, we had two groups coming in at the same time, I had to be inside to administer the session. So we had to run the session on the sprung floor. So hence, we had to incorporate change of directions. Um, second one, second uh, session, increase VO2, time at VO2 max, same. The only difference is no change of direction. And that's because we were running that out on the track. And as you can see, these are the acute physiological responses, high VO2, high heart rate, moderate lactate responses. Um, and no type 2 fiber recruitment because um, they're running below mass. And the only difference here, small to moderate, um, and that's just because there's no change of direction. And yeah, and then from there, as I said, it makes it really easy. So group one, two, three, four, five, they're the individual, diff individual distances for the, each group. And as you can see from group 4.72 to group 4.31, there's roughly seven meters difference, which is quite significant when you multiply it over the course of the session and they're completing an extra 250 meters at high intensity. So that's a wrap. Any questions, feel free. Um, as I said, I apologize if it was lacked a bit of flow and it was a bit disjointed, but 
Yeah, there's not much I could do. Any questions? Yep. Um, once you've established that maximum aerobic speed, in a, on, in a practical day-to-day -day training session, how do you uh, get them to run at a percentage of that maximum? Oh, just as I showed there. So basically, just establish or come up with like a template. Um, and you, like if you're, I'm assuming, if you're, are you administering the sessions yeah. yourself? Yeah, I just, you basically assign groups and from there, um, basically set the sessions out for the girls. So in that particular scenario, I would set, um, you know, five different cones um, of varying distances according to what the um, spreadsheet says. So basically, you, it's, the onus is on you to set it up and then when you're actually administering the session, the onus is on you to make sure they stick to the time. So they, if it's 20 on, 10 off, they're only getting back on 20 seconds on, not any faster, not any slower, because then that defeats the purpose of this.